before we hear the scripture, I want to share um, a story. I was eating one time at Chick-fil-A with my family, and I noticed a little boy across the restaurant from us, and he was staring and pointing at me. And his mom finally came over and said to me, my son recognizes you as one of the pastors at the church where he goes to preschool. But he's confused about why one of God's people is out in the world. <laughs> he thinks you live there. And he wants to know why you are enjoying a number one combo at Chick-fil-A with that man and those children. God no longer lives at church. And yet, we oftentimes show up, don't we, as if this is God's home, this is God's address. We imagine worship as the place, the, the building we go to, to experience God, to, re to receive spiritual things. But today, in the Gospel of John, John invites us to reorder our order, to imagine a place we're sent from in order to meet and partner with God in the world in our everyday lives. I invite us together to pray the prayer for illumination this morning. Lord, reorder our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading uh, this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. Jesus is cleansing the temple today. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove off all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them, and because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us again pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts reorder us anew for you. Amen. So this is the season of Epiphany. And we are reading stories from the Gospel of John as a way of learning again who God is as revealed in and to us in Jesus. If you remember two weeks ago, this guy named Nathaniel, referring to Jesus, said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? To which Jesus, 
invited us to begin again, to restart despite our prejudices and biases. And then last week, Jesus revealed to us this bootlegger Jesus, changing water to wine, refilling what is empty with an abundance of grace, and using humans, using us to be a part of the miracle making. And then today, it's Passover, which is a week-long celebration of a freedom only God can bring. And Jews from all over are traveling to Jerusalem to worship, to give thanks. And they enter into the temple courtyard, the courtyard of this temple that's being built. They started building it 46 years ago, you heard it. Gary Reed, and it's still under construction. That temple court outside the temple inside is bigger than a football field. And there are cows mooing and, and sheep bleeding and doves cooing and coins clanging and people yelling. And the people are grateful. Because this is how they do worship. This is business as usual. They show up and they need to exchange their Roman money for temple money. And they show up needing to buy an animal, an unblemished sacrificial animal, to be a part of that worship there. It's into this worship that Jesus walks. Oftentimes, we are impressed by all the wrong things. In John chapter 2, they're impressed by this temple that's being built so grand, isn't even yet completed. It reminds me of the largest incompleted, uncompleted Roman Catholic cathedral in the world. La Sagrada Familia is in Barcelona, Spain. And they are finally halfway through constructing this cathedral. They've been building now for 128 years. And before the architect Gaudi died in 1970, he was asked about this very long construction timeline to which he said, my client is in no hurry. <laughs> we build for God, amen? And it is a good and a beautiful and right thing until it is not. Because it doesn't take long before what I love most are the things that I can see and touch. And I begin to choose defining space over spirit, order instead of obedience. Into this beautiful temple walks Jesus. And we go from holding our Malbec on the dance room floor, water to wine, to clinging to one another in fear on the front lawn of the church because here's this Jesus who's angry and he's flipping tables and he has a cord in his hand. We try to, to control this revelation by naming it the cleansing of the temple as if Jesus has shown up to politely and quietly scrub the floors, right? This delicate euphemism to describe a major disrupting reorder. Now, I thought I knew what this was about. That Jesus is here to call out the crime of price gouging the poor at church. And indeed, in the other three Gospels, that is what Jesus is doing. And that's easy to get behind, right? Jesus is there to set the, the wrong right, to get rid of injustice. But that's actually not the way that John records the story. In fact, Jesus' words are different in John. He doesn't call the people gathered there to sell animals a den of robbers. Instead, in John, Jesus is recorded saying, do not turn my father's house into a marketplace. But Jesus, that's what it is. And, and that's what we need it to be. 
in, in order for worship to happen. And so what Jesus is asking seems impossible. What do you mean, Jesus? Because you see, he says, the temple as the home of God is now obsolete because I am here, son of God. He says to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And now even his best friends don't understand what he's talking about. John says they don't get it until he is crucified, dead, and raised up again. Then they understand that he is talking about his body. God had dwelled, had lived in the temple as his home address but now lives among all people through his son, Jesus. And so when Jesus chases out the animals and flips over those tables, it's his way of saying God is changing everything, and everything is going to be made noon. And soon this building will be irrelevant because God is present in me. Why? Because God is present in Jesus. And after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, God is present in all believers everywhere through the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ's body has become the temple. And in the power of the Spirit, now our bodies are our temples. Which means us as the church, you and me, we're here in the world to carry on what God began in Jesus. How, how many of you have ever been here in worship when we've invited our children to come forward and, and uh, given them Bibles and prayed over them as they have begun their new Sunday school year? Have you been here when we've done that? A couple of you, yeah? Have you ever been here when we have prayed over our youth and commissioned them into missions? Oh, lots of hands. Yes. How many of you were here last Sunday when we blessed and prayed over our new 2018 council leaders? Many of us. And then just 20 minutes ago, right, we did that beautiful work yet again, blessing and praying over these servant leaders who help make worship possible. Let me ask you this. Are you here in April? when we invite all the certified public accountants to stand and then we pray over them before they go into their 70-hour work weeks? Oh, were you here that Sunday when we brought all the plumbers and electricians and AC back people forward and gave thanks for heating and air and lights and plumbing? Were you here for that Sunday? Yeah? What about the Sunday when we had all of you stand who were in the medical field and, and gave thanks for your ministry? and the medical care professions in which you serve. It's true, we do a really good job of supporting and praying over and acknowledging our roles in the life of the church, and that's a good thing. But unintentionally, we undervalue all the other roles we have in our lives. We lift up church as the one place where we meet God and live out our religious lives. And in doing so, we, we don't mean to do it, but we undermine what John is inviting us into, that God is here and out into the world waiting for us there. One of the best descriptions of this kind of church that I've heard is the work of, of, of C.S. Lewis in his Narnia series. These four children who travel from war-torn London to this land called Narnia where they meet this mighty lion named Aslan who is Christ-like, right? And with Aslan's help, they defeat the white witch. And in the second book, they're back in Narnia again to defeat evil again with the help of Aslan. But this time he tells the two oldest children you will never return to Narnia again. And then in the third book, at the very end, he meets the two youngest children at the edge of the Eastern Sea and says to Edmund and Lucy, you as well will never again return to Narnia. Lucy is distraught. 
at the idea that she will never again see Aslan, to which he reassures her and says, no, 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 Lucy, you will see me, for I am present in your world as well. Lucy's con confused. She's never seen him there, to which Aslan says, that is the whole reason for you coming to Narnia that you might come and get to know me here and experience me here so that you might return to you, your world and in knowing me already, see me and know me and experience me there. This beautiful invitation to be church. When we come into church to hear the story told again of God's love for us and together to come to the table for the sacrament of Jesus among us God's body broken victory for our spirits and our lives here experiencing and getting to know God so that we can go back into our lives and recognize that God is already there do we order our worship do we order the life of our church in this way What needs to be turned over or driven out so that we might experience and understand the worship of God in our every single day life, the temple of God, the home of God, the building of God in each of us. God's dwelling places, the holy of holies, now deep in our souls, in our spirits, propelling us into the world, carrying out God's love for the world and God's people in the world. This morning, I want to invite you to, to sing a response to him called Sanctuary. This very specific prayer, God, make me your temple, right? And that hymn, that song, is not printed in any of our hymnals. So if you know the words, sing along. And if you don't, that's okay. Receive those words as a prayer over your life. And as you're, you're singing, I want to invite you to consider on that piece of paper, that yellow piece of paper I mentioned earlier. And if you don't see a yellow piece of paper sitting there in your pew, um, you, you can also use the offering envelope. But I want to invite you to write down on that yellow piece of paper or, or on the offering envelope one place where you know you will be this week. Where will your life take you this week? One place that you know you'll be this week. And when the offering plate is passed, that you might lay that in the plate as an offering of that place and your intersection with that place as a place of worship as a place of experiencing God. And during the offertory prayers, Laura and I will lift up some of those places as a way for us as a body of Christ to understand where our worship takes us as we worship God in the world. This invitation to reorder our lives does not aim at right ways of doing church or spiritual things. God's reordering is, to be, is for us to be remade in the image of Christ. And it's so important that Jesus flips over the old way and creates this new way. Worship is not a transaction, but it is a revolutionary reordering of who we are in Christ. Jesus walks up to the doors of this beautiful sanctuary. Except he's not here to be let in. He's here to propel us out. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.